God, we're so grateful to hear from Pastor Jim how you have equipped and enabled him in his ministry and calling to now impact an entire nation as he is training and equipping leaders and pastors in places that do not have the privilege and access to things that we have here. God, now as we turn to your word, God, first I recognize that I am a <laughs> flawed communicator, Lord. But Holy Spirit, I ask that you would, uh, this day and every time that we turn to your word, uh, open our hearts as we open your word. God, I ask that the things that are spoken today, God, would be of your spirit and what is of your spirit, that it would sink deep into our heart. God, we continue to ask that you would speak to us, that you would communicate to us, God, and that our lives would be uh, continue to be transformed by your grace as you redeem us and shape us into the image of your Son. Thank you for the privilege it is to gather together. Thank you for the privilege it is to be here in this place and to be able to access online. God, this is a privilege. God, this is a privilege to have the word, your word, in our language that we can understand. So speak to us, we pray. Open our hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we are concluding the first half of our series in the letters to the Thessalonians. We're going to be concluding 1 Thessalonians, and then we're going to take a little pause, of course, for Palm Sunday, and then our Good Friday service, by the way, Friday of Good Friday, 7 p.m. Hope you can make it out here for about an hour, hour and 15 service. And then we'll move into Easter. And then after Easter, we're going to pick up the series again, starting in 2 Thessalonians. So we're going to finish today, pause, and jump into the, the next letter when we come back after Easter. So if you remember from last week, we talked about two of the three ships that God is asking us to get on board and that we can raise our sail and that he can move us forward as a congregation. We talked about leadership and what leadership is to do and, what, and how we are to respond to them. We also talked about fellowship, how we are to connect and communicate with one another. This morning, we're going to look at the third thing that the Holy Spirit highlights for us in this passage of Scripture, talking about worship, that we can get on board in our personal worship, we can get on board in our corporate worship, and then we can see God working in us um, and among us as He gathers us, us together and transforms us in, into His image. So, this is where we are going today, and I want us to hear what God would have to say to us, because worship plays a big part in our lives as we relate to a living God. We are called to be, remember, living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, that this is our spiritual act of worship. But the trouble with living sacrifices is that they tend to crawl off the altar, right? In the Old Testament, the sacrifices were killed, and that was it. It was in worship. But now we're called to be a living sacrifice, that we would live for our faith, not just die in the faith. Sometimes I think it would be easier to die for our faith than live in our faith, okay? And so you and I have to be focused upon, God, how can we live in such a way that our lives now is a fragrant aroma? It is worship to you every single day. Worship does not just happen when we gather together here in this place on Sundays, okay? This is a form of worship, and it's a powerful gathering that God has given us. But he also asks us to live as people of worship, that we would commune and connect and live in such a way that he would be worshiped and honored as we go about every single day. So as the New Testament letters are put together, primarily the letters of Paul, you'll see the first half of these letters tell us what is true. And then the second half of these letters usually tell us what to do. Okay, so he goes on telling us what is true about God and what is true about us. And then he moves now, because of this, 
This is what we are to do. So we are in that section of this letter that tells us what to do based upon what is true, what God has done, what he has done in us and for us, and what he's doing through us. So Paul continues to tell us about worship and how we are to get on board. And here's the first point. God's will for personal worship. God in his grace not only tells us and invites us to be in relationship with him, but he tells us how we are to worship, what his will is, and this is for our personal worship. Okay, This section is how we are to personally worship and live for God. So here it goes. Ready? Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Does that sound easy to you? <laughs> Call order. And by the way, if you want to memorize some verses of Scripture, you can start with these. <laughs> right? We have these up, and if you go to a slide with a picture of these verses on it, this is on our wall above our fireplace. Rejoice always. You memorized a verse, right? Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, at first glance, this seems nigh to impossible to do. Rejoice always, always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Really? That's what we are supposed to do? How are we to do this, and how can we have a better understanding of what is being asked of us? So let's look at this first command. Rejoice always. Now, in the Bible we know that's true. But also in the Bible there are other scriptures that tell us, mourn with those who mourn. And Ecclesiastes tells us that there's a season for everything. There's a time to dance, and there's a time to grieve. Also, in James it tells us, Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. So we have to ask ourselves, does the Bible contradict itself? So God, you say to rejoice always, and then over here you say, you know what? There are times in which you are to mourn. There are times in which that instead of being joyful that we are to mourn. So what is going on here? Does the Bible contradict itself? So as people of faith, I want to put this out to you. Because our lives, you go to the next slide, please. And this is a quote. Because our lives are built upon what is eternally true. Our lives are built upon what is eternally true. However, while our lives are lived within what is temporarily true. Okay. Now you... And my life is built upon what is eternally true, right? Let's think about this a little bit. What's eternally true? Jesus will come again. Okay. What's eternally true? He will remake heaven and earth. What's eternally true? God so loved the world, right? That he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, will have eternal life. What is eternally true? We always have hope. Because God is with us even until the end of the age. Our lives are built upon the foundation of what is eternally true. 
even though we live in what is temporarily true. Temporarily, these bodies break down. Right? Temporarily, you might be living in a body that doesn't function as it was designed. That's temporarily true, but it's not eternally true. Temporarily, we have diagnoses of cancers, and our loved ones die pre prematurely. We know that this is true, but only temporarily. Right? What's eternally true gives us greater joy. This is why Jesus on the cross, for the joy set before him. Do you remember this? Endured the cross. He, in the most excruciating circumstance that anyone has lived through, the whippings and the beatings and the denials and the sufferings and the cruel humiliation and death for the joy set before him, gave him strength to endure what he was going through today. This is why Paul can say this. He can say these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, hey, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We worship because we have faith. And our faith is built upon the rock of the promises of Christ. And because of these promises, we always have reason to rejoice. The suffering and the tears and the heartache and the brokenness and the emptiness and all of these things at times in which we all face. They are temporarily true, but they will not be eternally true. And so this is why we fix our eyes on Jesus, right? This is why we think about what is to come. In doing so, there is an underlying foundation of joy. We as Christians will suffer, right? But we suffer with people who have an underground foundation of something to rejoice about. I'm not abandoned. I'm not forsaken. I'm not forgotten. God will make all things new. This is how we rejoice always. We can rejoice always knowing that this is temporary and thank God for His grace now, but what comes is eternal and we can rejoice in that. So if you are in the midst of something that is excruciatingly difficult, do you mourn through it? You do. But underneath that, there is a foundation of hope of what is eternal, built upon the promises of God that it will not always be this way. Rejoice always. Second, he tells us to pray continually. Now, can you literally pray 24-7? Okay? Maybe you can, but I can't. You know why? I sleep, right? You know why? There are some times in which my mind has to be incredibly focused on the task that is on hand. So when he tells us to pray continually, what does this mean? It means that our prayer time is not just before meals. And on Sundays it is always, right? What if you just talk to your spouse five minutes a day or your kids? What type of relationship would that have? Not so good, right? He's talking about, he's calling it out, right? He's talking about a continual conversation, right? A continual checking in, a, um, a lifestyle in which we are praying. Okay? Instead of turning um, when we're facing something to a book or to a friend, we say, God, can you help me with this? God, this is what's going on during my day. Do you guys do this during your day? Pray. And you can pray all the time. It's checking in. Like, I check in with my wife. Hey, what's happening? You know, we'll text, we'll communicate throughout the day. There is a constant connection. And so God is asking us to not reserve our worship to a Sunday morning or a prayer meeting. Okay? 
Our connection through prayer can happen and should happen continually, right? When we get up in the morning, God's on our minds, right? When we go about our day, there's like, hey, we're facing a problem or we have something good that takes place, that there is a prayer that is going up all the time. I believe the church is as weak as it is because we fail to connect to our source of power through prayer. One of the most least attended meetings in every church that I know of is the prayer meeting. Why? Well, I don't know how to pray. Do you know how to talk? You know how to pray. And me and our our friends, they outpray us. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm not saying that as, a, as, as, as shame or as a competition. Okay? I'm saying that because they understand in oppression and desperation the power of prayer more so than we do. How do you like that? You probably pray the most when things are going the worst. Is that true in your life? No one's going to admit it. I'll admit it. Okay. Why is that? Well, because in those, minute, those moments, we're not fooled by our own pride to thinking that we've got this. We recognize that we don't have it. And there's things that are bigger than us. And so we pray. And then when things get better, what do we do? Forget them. We play. Have you ever read the book of Judges, by the way? You read that book? It's really good. Hey. They sin and walk away from God. It's really bad. Ooh. They reach out to God. It gets better. Yay. And they forget about God. Oh. That's the whole cycle of the book of Judges, by the way. Wouldn't it be amazing that our church, number one, they can say, oh, why are you, even in this, you have an outlook of rejoicing. Why? Why is it that you pray? Because we are worshiping God. This is what we're called to do as individuals. I can pray for you, but I can't pray as you. We all have opportunity to connect to God. Thirdly, this is it. Give thanks in all circumstances, which means we are to thank God in both our good and our difficult circumstances. (laughs) Notice this is not give thanks for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. There's some circumstances I'm not thankful for, right? But in it, is there a reason to give thanks to God. And this is not easy to do, especially for those of who of you who when given a donut, all you focus in on is the hole. H O L E, right? Some of us are prone to look at the negative, right? It is a powerful expression of our faith to choose to give Thanks. You know the pilgrims who gave us the national holiday of Thanksgiving? They dug seven graves for every house they built. But yet, they gave thanks. So I want to encourage you this way. God, will you help us to Be a thankful people. I want to encourage you to look for something in your situation to be thankful for. There has been plenty of studies that have been done about people who are thankful or grateful. Know what happens to these people? Their relationships all of a sudden start to improve. Know what else starts to improve? Their health. Their physical health. Their mental health. Know what else starts to improve? Their length of their life. Right? This is study after study after study after study. Okay. So we give thanks not just to get those benefits, but we give thanks because everything that is good comes from our Father. And we can say amen to that. 
When's the last time that you really gave thanks, right? And it says, give thanks in all circumstances. Circumstances. In all circumstances. So if you want to know how to worship, and you say, well, you know, worship is just, you know, with, with guitars. It's not. <laughs> it's rejoicing always. You don't need a guitar. It's praying continually. It's giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So let's talk about the next thing. God's will for God's way in congregational worship. He goes on saying, first, you guys can pray, you guys can worship, give thanks, do this. This is God's will for you, and I encourage you to try it, secondly, and to do it. God's way in congregational worship, verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. So when you get together, there's two do nots, and there's two things we are to do. Do not quench the spirit. When's the last time you used the word quench as I quench my thirst right now? It's a word we're not too familiar with. You know what that means? Put out. Like someone putting out a flame. You know, often in Scripture, the Holy Spirit is pictured with what? Flame. Tongues of fire that came down. And so Paul is saying, when you get together as a congregation, do not put out the Holy Spirit's working. Now that's kind of weird to think about. That means that we can resist the Holy Spirit's work. The answer to that is yes. Well, how do we resist the Holy Spirit's work in our life? We're not listening. Hardness of heart. There are people in Jesus' day, Jesus Christ speaking, Not some preacher, but the Word incarnate, and they resisted him. So when you get together, listen to what God would say to you. When you get together, be sensitive to the promptings of God. When you get together, be open to what God would say, what God would do how God would move. And you would think of all places where we would be open to God's working, it would be in the church. However, he says, to the church, don't quench the Spirit. And do not treat prophecies with contempt. Now, that might scare some of you. (laughs) Prophecies, right? What are we talking about here? Well, I'll tell you this. If you don't know this about me, I grew up in a charismatic church, in a charismatic background. Do I personally believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today? I say, yes, I do. Now, I've experienced some profound things when people would speak to me believing it is of the Lord, And it's positively and powerfully blessed me and helped me. And there are times in which someone would speak something that they thought of the word was of the Lord, but was not of the Lord. And it's done some considerable damage. So he's saying, listen, don't quench the spirit and do not treat prophecies with contempt. Have I at times treated prophecies with contempt? Absolutely. I used to be on a list of people. You guys know about modern day prophets. We're going to be real right now. Can we just have a little conversation? Okay. There's people today that are giving prophecies, right? Especially every four years when a presidential election comes up, there's people that say, thus saith the Lord. Such and such will work. Did that just happen? Of course it did. Were most of them wrong? Of course they were. What about that? Can God speak? 
I want to say, yes, he does. But I've come to a point sometimes where I just, I don't want to hear it, right? I used to be on a list. I'm just being real honest right now. We're just having a little conversation, right? Okay? I used to be on a list collecting prophecies, such and such, such and such, such and such, and the prophets would say thus and thus and this. I had a file about this thick back when we printed things, right? Put it in there, put it in there, put it in there, put it in there. Hey, hey. And then I'd take them out. Nope. Nope. Nah, nope. I'm like, hmm, I'm kind of done with this. Right? So we can swing the pendulum. <laughs> don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies <laughs> with contempt. Swing the pendulum so hard, so far that we don't want to have to do anything with things that will even smell like something other than what is written. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. It's speaking to us. So we have to open our hearts up. God, what are you saying? We have to open our spirits up. We have to open some space sometimes in which God may speak to us. We have to make space for this. So that's on one side of the, equa the, the, the equation. Do not quench the spirit and God help us from doing that. In the book of Revelation, Jesus talks about his spirit being like a lamp stand and says, listen, you don't pay attention to what I'm saying. Of course, we can say that from the word, of course. That lamp will go out. Now, on the other side, he says, but test them all. Right? Hold on to what is good. If you hear something that you believe is from the Lord, you need to test it. How do you test it? But because we test it by what we know is true, which is the word of God. Someone say amen right there, right? Right? If someone prophesies to you that God is a three-eyed monster, reject it. Right? And if a doctrine is there or, the, or, or, or something along the heart of God even is not found to be true, we have to easily reject it. So we reject and we test things that we believe are from the Lord. And have you ever heard something in your heart that you might think is from the Lord? Right? I am now hanging on to some promises which I believe is from the Lord, but I test them. You test them against the word, and you test them against reality. Someone says that you're going to have a baby, you never have a baby. What they said was wrong, right? Someone says that such and such president is going to be president, and they're not president. They're wrong. It's gotten quiet in here. Let's just take a little break. Please listen to the revealed word of God before you listen to any prophet. You know this about people who um, try to counterfeit money. They study the real thing so they know what the real thing is so they can say, nah, that ain't, that ain't it. Study the word. Okay. Test Prophecies, be open, okay. be open to God speaking his word. Am I prophesying in a degree today? Yes, of course, speaking his word. Be open, but test it. If it's good, hang on to it. But reject every kind of evil. Remember what context this is. This is in a church can evil things happen in a church? Absolutely they can. It can happen. And the grievous, most grievous evil is when evil is done in the name of God. You know, these pastors know. 
grievous. And there's people in this building, because I know a number of your stories that have been deeply wounded in the church. So what is the Holy Spirit test telling us? We know what to do in our personal worship, and then when we get together, be open to God's Spirit. Open the door of your heart for God to speak. But test it and reject what is evil. And it could be in the form of evil doctrine. It could be in the form of evil activity. And this is in the church services. <laughs> Tension grabbing, lying, anger, hatred. Don't hang on to these things. And may God free us of these things. So let's go on. Spiritual act of worship. We're getting on board. God, help us to worship you personally. God, when we get together, speak to us. Impact us, prompt us, help us to follow with your leading. And when we, and as we are doing these things, God works. This is the next point, okay? God's work of personal redemption. God's work of personal redemption. I like what he tells us. This is his final prayer at the very end of this letter, the first letter to this group. Okay. They asked him some questions. Apparently someone was prophesying that the day of the Lord had come. He made it clear to them. We'll talk about it again in the next book. But then he says this. No, check what God is doing. May God himself, the God of peace, so may God sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. That's good news, right? When we come together together, God does the work. You are not your own redeemer. Thank you. God justifies. Do you see this? <laughs> May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. This is sanctification. Who's doing the work of sanctification? God is, right? May your whole spirit, body, soul, and body be kept blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is glorification, sanctifying us, right? Working, may God himself. He's the one who justifies, make your whole body, spirit, kept blameless. He's the one that glorifies at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you. This is what you are called to, and he is faithful, and he will do it. This should give you some hope here. Right? And God himself, the God of peace, this is what he's doing, sanctifying us by step by step. What is he doing? Our whole self, spirit, soul, body works in us until when the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is what? Faithful. He will do it. Just take a deep breath in that. God, you're justifying. God, you're sanctifying. God, you will be glorifying. He will do it. He is working. God's work is among us, and he is redeeming us for himself. This is good news. God is working even right now. He's working. 
And we pray, God, can we see more of this? God, can we experience more of this? God, can we see more of your evidence? And we ask him for this, and he will work where he's welcomed. So we say, God, we welcome you here. Work in redeeming us, and he is. You are not as you once were. And how you are will not be how you will be. God himself will do it. Be rest assured. Lastly, God's warmth. I like this. God's warmth in congregational connection. So Paul is going on. He told him so so many things. He tells us so many things. In your personal worship, do this. In your congregational worship, do that. God will be working amongst you. And then when you come together, brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of the Lord... Jesus Christ be with you all. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. You know how we can experience love to one another? We can pray for one another. This is the gift God gives to us, right? This is how we can express warmth to one another. I am praying for you. And we pray for you. This last week, I had the privilege of, um, <laughs> I used my pastor, my pastor card and I went to the hospital because I wanted to see Robert Mullen, who has been in the hospital, okay? Robert was diagnosed with COVID, and so they had him uh, on oxygen, and they had him isolated. And so I could see Robert, but we had glass, right? We had glass. I couldn't physically go in there, and we were talking like this to one another. Robert, how are you doing? We communicated a little bit. Know what I was super glad for at that moment? Prayer. You know why? Prayer can cut through glass. Prayer can cut through any distance. Prayer can penetrate any bunker, any jail cell. The Holy Spirit can cut through any heart. So the warmth was there because of prayer. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. This is a gift of God. Greet all people with a holy kiss. Does that happen in our culture? No. Gross. Right? And that culture was very, very common. I've been to places where this is, a, this is a thing, right? You kiss, like it's a greeting. Right? Weird for us, not for them. What is he telling us here? Greet all people with a holy kiss. That means draw close to one another. In the age of social distancing. In order to connect, there needs to be closeness. We're not just talking physical closeness. We're talking relational closeness. We get close to things that are safe. And so that means that there needs to be a safety here where you feel encouraged to draw someone close. Not just physically close, but relationally close, mentally close. Warmth of connection. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I don't want anyone in church not to have a friend. You know what one of the, the, the worst diseases of our culture is? loneliness probably kills more people than cancer and heart disease combined there are people in this room that are lonely today I'm going to tell you that well you're here well how do you connect 
means you have to feel safe. Well, how do you do that? You have to trust. How do you do that? There has to be consistency. How do you do that? Someone needs to open the door. God, help us to trust one another, to open our lives to one another. Greet all people, God's people, the holy kiss. Experience the warmth of his spirit. And there is warmth gathered around the word. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. We connect through the word. Right? Paul says, hey, read this to everybody. Connect, pray, read. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Lee has challenged us to grow in God's grace. Right? Let's grow in God's grace. Don't you want more grace here in this room? Say amen to that. Right? The world needs more grace. <laughs> it needs more of an embrace. So I'm asking you, the scripture is asking you to get on board. Okay. We're going to review and we're going to conclude. Get on board in connecting in the three ships, one of leadership. We will support, we will recognize, we will respect, we'll be at peace. We'll work hard, we'll be true, we'll be honest, get on board, raise the sails. Tells us to get on board in fellowship, right? To connect with one another, to love one another, to share your lives with one another. So we say, I'm getting on board that ship. Raising the sails, God blow us forward. Get on board the ship of worship, right? Personally, corporately. God works amongst us and gives us grace. Remember that God is working in and through you. He is faithful. He will do it. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit is highlighting in your life today. Could be that, you know what? I have a struggle with rejoicing always. Ask God to help you. Could be you say, you know what? I only pray very, very anemically, which is unfortunately the truth of most American Christians. I can say that. Help me to step up this game. God, this week, help me to give thanks in all circumstances. Help me to be open to your spirit. So I'm going to pray, but we're going to pause. And if you could play something, that would be great. I'm going to pause for like a minute. I'm going to say a little prayer, and then I'm going to pause. So God, here we are. In this day, signs of spring is among us. Some of our friends who have been disconnected are able to return, and we are grateful to be in the house of the Lord. And God, we are desperate for your spirit to work among us. You are the one who changes hearts and minds. You are the one who sees. You are the one who heals. You are the one restores. You are the one who transforms. So God, I ask that you would continue to impact our hearts. God, I'm going to pause. Help us to listen to you. So Holy Spirit, please touch our hearts. Please speak to us now. Father, we ask that your grace would be evident among us. That this church would truly reflect our community, would be truly multi-ethnic, would reach the nations of the world for your namesake. That we would become more like you.
glorified in this place, we pray in Jesus' name.